All right, we are in week six of our Show Me Your Jesus series. And when I say week six, this is the last week of us on this series, as next week we'll be starting something new. But in this series, we have been talking about how so often we can get our idea of who Jesus is. This is my Jesus, the Jesus that I like. But sometimes we then don't line up our Jesus with who the Jesus we see in the Bible to be, or, or who the Jesus that I experience in my life actually is. And so we've been talking about some things where Heather preached a few Sundays on how sometimes we think that my Jesus isn't going to let anything bad ever happen to me. But we see that God chooses to let things happen so that we might be better through them. We talked about how my Jesus, uh, we asked the question, is he the same as what we see to be the, the old, angry, Old Testament God? And see that God is consistent in both his love and his concern to take out sin in the Old and the New Testament. Those things and more we've been talking about over these last five to six weeks as we have been exploring, does my Jesus line up with the real Jesus? If you ever want to find out what your limits are, I strongly encourage you to take care of another human being. If you have ever been a caretaker like a parent, taking care of small children, you will very quickly discover what your limits are. If you ever take care of one of your parents or an older adult, you will very quickly discover how hard or how far your limits go, or if you take care of your spouse or, or anyone in this life, taking care of someone is, is one of what I would argue the most challenging things we do as human beings. And in that moment, we discover our limits. And we discover whether our limits are a hard fixed wall that we run into, or if there's the potential for us to go farther than what we could believe we could do on our own. And the problem with our idea of our limits is we start to believe that my Jesus will never give me more than I can handle. That, that in this life, if I am ever exhausted, if I am ever at the end of my rope, that must not be God's plan for me because my Jesus would not give me more than I can handle. And what do we mean by that? In, in my life, you, usually it's, I just don't like to do stuff that makes me uncomfortable. I don't like to go to those areas that go outside of my giftings, my personality, my comfort zone. Well, I, I don't have to tell people about Jesus because I don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism. Some, someone else can go tell people about Jesus. I, I don't have to be nice to other people because I just don't have compassion or mercy. I have Pastor Heather. She can be nice to other people. I don't have to do that. We get to this point where we say, my Jesus wouldn't make me do that. Whatever the that is in your life, he obviously wouldn't make me do that. Some people might make the argument that my Jesus won't ever make me do anything. But as we've seen in this series, our Jesus cares about how we live our life. My Jesus cares not only about my actions, but about my heart. And so where do we go to start this conversation? Will Jesus give us more than we can handle? We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 11. Right before this, the Apostle Paul has been talking, and he's been pointing at the nation of Israel and what happened to Israel in the past. And he shared all of the bad mistakes that Israel did of how they kept complaining about God and how God was against them. And if only God was better, then we wouldn't be in all these terrible situations after we got out of Egypt. And in verse 11, we see why Paul has been sharing these things. These things happened to them, being Israel, as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think that you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. 
and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So we see here, specifically in the context of temptation, that God will never let us have more than what we can handle. And we see here is that God knows our limits. God knows your breaking point. God knows what it's going to take for you to get on your knees and cry out to him. God knows when your attitude is going to shift, is going to change. God knows what you can handle, and God knows what you think you can handle. And in this moment, as the Apostle Paul is talking, he says, let's talk specifically about temptation. Let's talk about sin. He says, God knows your limits, and God will make sure that there is always a way out for you. That as you are struggling and sin is trying to rear its ugly head in your life, there is going to be a moment when God provides a way out. And that looks different for other people. Your cell phone goes off. You have a bad heart, and suddenly you read scripture about how you have a bad heart and you need to change. You hear a sermon. Someone in church talks to you and and shares with you something that speaks to you. God acts in so many different ways to give us a way to change, to give us a way out. Some people say that the, the way that God communicates to his people is through his word, through his spirit, and through his people. And those things should always line up with each other. I'm not going to hear something from God's people that doesn't line up with his word. If I believe that the Holy Spirit is speaking to me about something, it has to line up with his word. And God speaks to us through other things because he knows what the problem is for us. And I love in this passage that, that Paul is sharing is like, look at the Israelites. And I don't know about everybody else, but sometimes my reaction is, yeah, look at those Israelites. Look at all the mistakes they made. If I was in a similar situation, <laughs> surely I wouldn't have made those similar mistakes. And, and Paul interjects here, and he says, be careful that you do not fall. Recognize that it's very easy for us in our pride to think, I'm good, it's fine, I don't need to worry. And Paul says, watch yourself, because you could fall. And it's easy for us to think that we're all good until we're on our back looking up and ask, how did I get here? Because if God knows our limits in temptation, then surely he knows our limits in everything else as well. We jump ahead to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is talking to the church in Corinth once again, and he's talking about his his place and his authority as an apostle, and he's also addressing that there are people in the church who are showing up and saying, well, we're super apostles, as if such a thing existed. They say, look at us, like, we're so blessed by God, listen to us because we have new information. Church, you need to serve me because I'm a super apostle. And so Paul is writing, and he speaks to the church and says, has any of us ever shown up to you looking like that? No. And I'm going to brag about who I am in Jesus, and the things that Paul chooses to brag about are not the things that the world brags about. Paul brags about how much he gets beat up, how much he gets face down on the ground because of how much other people hate him. Because he loves Jesus. And so here in verse the second half of verse 7, he says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. But the Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And what Paul tells to us today is that God wants to do a mighty work in you. And I think we all say amen to that. I like the idea that God wants to do a mighty work in me. But the problem that we run into is that God wants to do a mighty work in us, and he works best when we're weak. And the problem for me is I don't like to be weak. The the worst part about exercising is the day after. When, when your muscles all hurt and you're sore and you don't want to get out of bed and you definitely don't want to exercise again. I don't like being weak. And that's just in the physical muscle instance. Let's talk about the weakness of my life when I experience hardships, when, when I can't help someone because I don't have it all together. And, and people come and ask me, oh, could you help me with this simple thing? No, I got enough on my plate. I'm weak right now. I don't like to be in that position. But what does Paul say? I will boast about my weakness because I know that when I am weak, I am strong. Not because of my own strength. It's it's not like there's something secret inside of us that, that when we get to the end of ourselves, suddenly extra energy just appears. No, it's God moving and working in and through us. And the part that also gets us uncomfortable is Paul says, I was given this issue. And when I asked Jesus to take it away, he said no. That rubs me the wrong way because I want my Jesus to always say yes. I always want my Jesus to say Oh, whoops, that was a mistake. Sorry, I gave you a thorn in the flesh, Paul, but that was my bad. uh, There was a clerical error in the angels, and I just need to scrub that, and your account will be clear. No, Paul says, in order to keep me from being conceited, in order to keep me humble, in order to keep me from not getting puffed up with pride because, hey, I'm up the apostle Paul. I'm kind of a big deal. Jesus gave me something to remind me that I'm not all that. I was given a messenger of Satan. And we don't even know exactly what that is. Was there a literal being that was waking him up at night and bothering him? Some people say it was the issue of Paul's eyesight that was losing. That every time he wrote, he says, look at how big my letters are. Probably because I'm like this close as I'm writing on the page. Other people say it was another physical infirmity, a sickness, a disease. We don't know. But Paul attributes it to God himself. And he attributes it to God himself with a positive outlook. He doesn't say God has cursed me. He doesn't say how dare God. He says, I am thankful that I was given this. And he explains the process. I had an issue. I took it to God. I didn't get a reply. I took it to God again. I didn't get a reply. I took it to God a third time, and he said no. Therefore, I will boast in my weakness, in my insults, in my hardships, in my persecutions, in my difficulties, because I know that's how God works best. And the unfortunate part for us is we've been told that the meaning of life is to be comfortable, that the meaning of life is to be happy. And we don't recognize that that's not what God said. God said, rely on me. Well, how do I rely on him if everything's good? I don't, usually. And so when we have this outlook on life, We can ask ourselves, how am I grabbing the hard things in my life and praising God for them? Because sometimes people can come into our life and look at us and look at our hard situation and be like, oh, poor you, that that thing that's really hard. And our response should be, praise God that that's hard. Praise God that I get to experience this hardship. 
but I don't do that in my life all the time. I don't look at my bank account when it's lower than I like and go, praise the Lord. I would like more money, but I don't have that, so praise God. When, when I'm up late at night because my child doesn't want to sit still and sleep, I don't go, praise the Lord, I don't get to sleep tonight. But what if we did? What if we said yes to Jesus in every single instance? And I love that Paul listed all of those things, weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties, because all of those things we all react to differently. There are some people in this room that I could insult you to your face. You wouldn't care. That's just not your personality. It's fine. And, and there are other people that I could say your cat is fat and you're ready to punch me in the face. There are some people that it can go through the hardest things in life, trials and difficulties, and you're fine. And there's other, others of us that you stub your toe and it's the end of the world. For some of us, people could murder us because we love Jesus. And we're like, hey, I get to go and see him early, praise the Lord. And there's some people who would rather turn away from God than have to experience hardship. And the question is, who will we be? When all of these things happen in our life, who will we be? Will we be the ones to say yes to Jesus every day? Because the reality is, is that God is in process. God is doing stuff in our lives continually. In Zechariah chapter 13, the Lord is speaking about his people. And he says, there's this thing that's going to happen. Two-thirds, they're gone. But this third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver. I will test them like gold. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is our God. The Bible talks a few times about refining like silver and gold. Now, I don't know if anyone in here is a metal worker or was a metal worker thousands of years ago, but way back in the day when they were taking care of silver and gold, you have to heat that, those things up a lot. And the point of, of doing this is to get rid of the impurities. You're mining, you get your silver and your gold and they're ore, and they're mixed in with everything else. And so you heat it up so those precious metals melt. And then as they melt, all of the bad stuff that you don't like rises to the top. So then the metal worker is able to just easily scrape off all the bad stuff. And so as you do this, if you're a metal worker, you have to keep an eye on the metal, on how it's melting once it gets to that special point, and then you need to keep checking on it because you know that it's done when you can see the reflection of your own face in the silver or the gold. That's how you know it's good. I've gotten rid of all the impurities. It is now pure and good. And it's interesting that God chooses to use this as an analogy multiple times in his word when he talks about us. There are so many parallels that we can pull out of that, that even in the fire, God is keeping an eye on us. He does not turn away. He does not look away. But he is waiting for the bad stuff in our life to rise to the top so he can get rid of it. And how long are we going to struggle and keep trying and pulling ourselves out of the fire when God knows that there's still some stuff we need to work on? And what is it going to take until God sees himself reflected in me? So that when he looks at Mark, he sees himself. And the beautiful thing about our uniqueness is that when God sees himself in us, it's not we're all looking the same. We all have our different giftings and abilities so that when he sees himself in me, it's the special me-flavored Jesus. And when he sees it in you, it's going to look different than me. We're not meant to be carbon copies of one another. So then the apostle Peter, in his letter, says, In all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. All kinds. Think of all those things that Paul just listed a few minutes ago. 
These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter says, we're better than gold. And, and gold takes a lot to actually get good. But even that is going to pass away. Even, even that beautiful gold that we're like, this is important. Humanity has been dealing with gold since the beginning, one might argue. Nations have risen and fallen based on who's got the gold. And Paul, Peter says, you are more important than that. Those things are going to pass away even though it takes a long time to make it good. You take a long time to get good, but you're not going to pass away. The things that are happening in your life are for a reason, so that you might come out the other side saying, yes, Jesus, more Jesus. I want to be with you, Jesus, because God wants to do a mighty work in us. My Jesus will give me more than I can handle. And because of that, I need to match what my Jesus thinks about me. Because it's easy for me to get to that place where I'm done. And Jesus says, I'm not done. And the question is, am I okay with that? Am I going to change the way that I think to be like, no, if I am here and this is what God desires for my life, I press on. And he will provide the means that I need. He will give me the strength. Because if Jesus, you told Paul... And if you told it to him, I'm going to assume that it's true for me too, that your strength is made perfect in my weakness. So show me that perfect strength today, because I need it. So what is the next step for us? What is the next step for you? For some of us, it might be to change our mind, to match what God thinks about me. Because when I think about myself, I'm not thinking about what God thinks. I'm thinking about my weakness, and that bums me out. When it could be revealing to me what God wants to do in me. For others of us, we might need to change our perspective on what we're going through. Paul says, I rejoice in these things. Do I need to change the way that I think about my situation so that I too rejoice in what God wants to do? And for other people, it might be to tell somebody else about what you've gone through. Because if you've lost a loved one, you can go to someone who's lost a loved one and say, I've been where you're at. If you want to talk, let's talk. I would love to share with you how I saw God move in my life in that situation. I've been laid off. Oh, you just got laid off? Let's talk about that, because you could take this as an instance of, of defeat, of I don't have worth because this company got rid of me. Let me share how God gives you value instead of your occupation. We all have experienced things in our life, and I believe that God has blessed us with these things so that we, in turn, can be a blessing to others, so that we recognize that we are not just an I, not just a me, but we are collectively together for the glory of God. I'd like to invite the worship team to come to the front and Pastor Heather as well as she is going to lead us in a time of communion. Jesus, we trust you. We trust you with the hard things in our lives because we believe that you are who you say you are. We believe that you are the God of the impossible. We believe that when you say that when we are weak, that your strength is made perfect, God, we take that at your word. And so, Jesus, in our weakness, would you show up in powerful ways? God, as, as we gather every Sunday and, and Wednesday and all the other times that we gather together, God, would we have reasons to celebrate how weak we are so that we can say, look what God did. Look how he moved. So that our time together is filled with celebration, 
because we know our God is real. So Jesus, we thank you, God. We thank you that you think so highly of us, that you do give us more than we can handle because you know that we have what it takes. It's in your name we pray.